cord and it's all yours john thank you sounds good before you go do you know if uh them being co-host will give me the power to upload my talk so everybody can see it you know using the share screen doesn't maybe i also need to be a co-host to put that you are a co in? you are a co-host i oh, made okay, you a co-host great thank you yep you have the superpowers excellent so let's see okay this meeting is being recorded got it and now I can share the screen. Here it is. Let's go right here. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to uh, listen to my talk today. Um, before I get into John, my one, John, I'm interrupting you. Sure. Uh, you said that somebody said that your voice is hard to hear. Is there a way that you can turn up your volume? Yeah. How about that? Does that change things? Is that any better? Can you all hear me now? Maureen, is that better for you? Maureen says, yes, that is better. Great. Excellent. That's better. Thank better you. Of changing the mic settings within my uh, little mic icon there. Okay. I'm going to stay on for the first few speeches so that everything's going okay. Go Sounds ahead. Good. Well, thank you again. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, before I launch into my talk, I just want to take a minute to introduce myself. Um, I'm John Steffen, and I'm an assistant professor of biology, uh, about to become the department chair of biology at Shepherd University in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Um, there, uh, I teach classes in herpetology, as well as classes in scientific writing, and then sort of general biology classes for majors, as well as non-majors. Uh, my training is uh, has always been in herpetology. I've been lucky enough to, you know, sort of ever since school find jobs as a herpetologist. So even as an undergraduate student, uh, I was lucky enough to work with people who were asking questions at a scientific level using herps and in the, these cases lizards. Uh, and I continued to pursue that interest by, you know, going to graduate school with different people and studying and answering different questions. Um, I've had the privilege to study a bunch of different lizards, uh, in particular asking questions about how lizards use color. And it's taken me down to a bunch of different places in the tropics. And uh, I've also spent a lot of time doing research on desert lizards and stuff before becoming a professor. And by the time I became a professor, I knew I was still really interested in reptiles and amphibians, but my questions became more broad and I started to really ask questions about colors and how animals in general use them. So my talk today is going to be about turtles and how turtles might be using color, but it's really uh, asking a question that is much more broad, uh, is really asking how reptiles use color, but it's, you know, it, it's an exceptional question that people haven't really asked yet although they've, a they've asked that question with a variety of other animals. So today's talk is going to also talk about other animals, sort of introduce you to the bigger question of how do animals use color. Okay, so uh, without any more talking about that, I'll get into my uh, research. I'll also, oh, somebody's got that. Okay, um, so here you can see a picture of a painted turtle, at least the neck uh, and the chin area. Um, so I'll be talking specifically about these stripes uh, and what makes them Excuse so me, John, interesting. John, we're not yes. seeing your picture. We're not seeing your picture. Oh, why would that be? See you, but not your slide. Uh, okay, what about uh, that? Oh, you can? Okay, well, I can't, so is everyone else okay? How about other folks? I can see mostly. Yeah, right now this picture is sort of a cutoff slide of the neck of a painted turtle. And it says the mystery of painted turtle spots and stripes. Can you see that? Yes. I'll vote yes. <laughs> okay. 
Should I continue then? Yes, go ahead. Maybe because I'm checking to let people in, I can't see that screen. I don't know. Okay, okay, but sounds good. And feel free to you know budge in again if you need to pass sure. on some information. Okay, so as you can see, here is a picture of uh, a Midland painted turtle. Uh, Chris Emmy's picked, uh, uh, and you can see the neck region showing these really colorful stripes uh, that make the painted turtle so uh, interesting to so many people. Now let's see if I can get this slide to advance. So this is a painted turtle, uh, and their scientific name is uh, Chrysemys picta. And they are among the most colorful reptiles in the U.S. Uh, and certainly people around here really seem to have an interest in painted turtles because of how colorful they are. It's uh, one of the things that they always mention to me when they're asking me questions about local turtles. And they have a specific interest in, you know, understanding why painted turtles are so darn colorful. So they're among the most colorful reptiles in the U.S., as well as even the northern hemisphere uh, throughout the entire world. Uh, if you survey a bunch of different northern hemisphere animals and kind of put them aside the painted turtle, the painted turtle really rises above most of them for being really colorful. So painted turtles are super colorful and it's one of the reasons why we're so into them and why we think they're cool. However, the color of reptiles and really that of all animals serves many purposes. You know, it's, it's aesthetically pleasing, but there are really many functions that it serves in the animal world. For example, an animal's color, including some turtles, often have colors that allow them to blend into a background. Uh, this is known as crypsis by camouflage. Uh, you can see in the upper left hand corner uh, that there's this tree that you can see all sorts of rough bark in. And maybe if you're lucky, you can look up closer and see that there are a series of legs that are surrounding a cephalothorax. That is in fact a spider that is hiding on the bark of that tree. In the upper right hand corner is a picture of a flounder that is resting against a sandy bottom uh, in a shallow pool. You can see the outline of the body, but much of the rest of the body of the flounder blends in quite well with the sand that it's laying against. And then finally, my favorite example of an animal that shows crypsis by camouflage. This is a pupil casing of a moth uh, and it has evolved to look like a piece of bird poop. Uh, and this is really a clever uh, way of being cryptic and camouflaging yourself because what sort of bird or other animal in its right mind would try to eat this pupil casing? You know, it looks like poop and it probably does not taste very good. We also know that color of animals serves another purpose as well. Whoops, and that is, whoops that of aposematism, that's also known as warning coloration. Many animals have aposematic warning coloration and it's usually provided by very boldly contrasting colors. And most often the colors are black, yellow, orange, and red. For example, in the upper left, oop, darn it, I can't use this mouse the way that I want to and I'm just gonna have to talk. In the left hand hey, side of the, yes, it's Bronwyn again. Sorry, I keep interrupting yep, sure you. Sure thing. There seems to be some gray bars on your screen. Weird. Where it shows, uh, it shows I guess, where your, um, if you can just uh, X out of the. Um... Hmm. Should I stop sharing for a second no. and see what it looks like? It's just, it's like at the top of the slide and on the, on the right hand side of the slide. Is there, is there anything that you can X out of on the slide uh, this time or huh. like now it just has now that it, it just grew on the right hand side. So I just I just minimized uh, a screen that says uh, talking John Stefan and that went away, but everything else is still there. How strange. Uh, so you can't see a part of the screen. Part can you the see slide. the middle of it? That, can you see? Can you see the slide that says aposematism, morning coloration? Yeah, we can see most of the slide. There's just some gray lines on each uh, 
uh, you, we can see most of it, but there's just gray lines on them. How strange. Yeah. Uh, well, Weird. let me talk through this if I can and see if the same, well, here, why don't we do this? Oh, so there is something happening from my end too. Does that look okay? You still has those two two weird gray squares, one at the top and one kind of at the on the right hand side. Well, so this has happened before, and there was a the if the speaker could um, kind of minimize something on their screen or yep that did something that moved it to the bottom oh. of the <laughs> screen. Okay, so that is just a menu bar. And maybe I'll just try to move it, you know, a little further down south to see that uh, it doesn't interfere with things. Does yeah, that seem can, okay? It's still okay. on the slide. So if you could, if you can, if you could take the menu even off of there, that would be great. I don't know how to do that. Uh, hmm. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. What if I do? No, that's not what we want to do. Uh, huh. You know, I've I've taught using uh zoom before and i guess i've always leave that bar i've always left that bar down there um is it going to be acceptable what if i just keep talking with that bar down at the bottom there isn't I mean, often there's not a lot of information down at the bottom usually of these slides yeah that's fine i would keep talking i mean most we can see most of the slide but people were commenting about it in the comment box so yeah, it's acceptable Maureen says it's acceptable so we can move on Okay, sounds good. Let me go back up to where we're getting here. So the color of animals serves many functions. One is crypsis, but another uh, function that the color of an animal, including reptiles, serves is that of a posomatic warning coloration. And these are colors that most often are made up of blacks contrasting against yellow, oranges, and reds. Here is the black banded poison dart frog from Costa Rica, uh, and its color is advertising the fact that it is uh, a highly poisonous skin secretion on the surface of this animal. And this uh, frog gets those poisons by eating orobatid mites as well as formicid ants that uh, have their own venoms in them. Of course, in the upper part of the screen, we see a coral snake uh, and the uh, so often mentioned color scheme, uh, red against yellow kill a fellow, red against black friend of Jack, surely shows you that this animal means business. Uh, it has a highly potent neurotoxin uh, that's released out of its fangs uh, and is highly lethal to almost anything that it bites. Over in the right is an orange and black nudibranch, uh, and this is a highly venomous animal as well, but it uses a spine to inject a, a prey item with that venom. And then finally uh, is the blue ringed octopus whose blue against red is indicating that this animal is also highly venomous, uh, has a neurotoxin that is highly lethal to anything it decides to poke with its spine. But color serves other functions as well. For example, in animals that uh, are highly species rich and diverse uh, and all occupy a relatively small area of space, the color of that animal can often, geez, can often indicate what's called species recognition. Uh, this usually happens in places, habitats that have many similar looking species co-occurring in that same environment. And if members of one species mate with another species, it becomes a very costly mistake for that individual. That individual has just spent a lot of time investing in trying to get the attention of its mate. And if it's a species, of course, that's not going to be a viable fertilization. And that animal will have wasted its time and perhaps subjected itself to predation. This explains how so many diff different Lake Malawi cichlid fish occur in a given environment uh, in Africa. It also explains how the dewlaps of so many different species of anole uh, share the same colors in a relatively uh, similar environment. Again, the reason why they have this is because there are so many uh, closely related species in that environment that an individual 
uh, avoids making a costly mistake if they don't mate with a different species. Other animals can color themselves using what's called bioluminescence. Uh, this is a color type that is created by an enzyme in a substrate called luciferin and luciferase. The enzyme gets stripped of an oxygenated molecule, and when that oxygenated molecule comes off, uh, it causes an electron to become excited, which emits a photon of light. And so these animals have special organs throughout their body that are loaded with luciferin and luciferinase, and they're capable of generating that electron excitation at will uh, to make these very bright colors and they can flash them in species-specific patterns. And still other animals are brightly colored, but the color of those, uh, the function of those bright colors is for sexual selection. Sexual selection is a major force in shaping reproduction, behavior, and many colorful traits. Usually in animals that have color for sexually selective purposes, uh, that color really provides sex. At the very most basic, it's going to tell an individual whether or not that animal is a male or a female. However, because the animal or because the color is being used by a particular sex to kind of convey information about how sexy it is, those color patches that they show, such as in this male bird of paradise here, usually indicate something about one's health, about its status in a social hierarchy, such as dominance, uh, that is capable of changing with age. And most often in these animals, juveniles don't really express the color. And then once an individual becomes an adult, if it's a male, it expresses those colors very greatly. And if it's a female, it expresses those colors not at all, or maybe drably. Most often in cases where animals color themselves for sexual selection, they use a pigment known as a carotenoid. You all probably know carotenoids just from eating vegetables. Uh, we, we now, as you know, Americans and humans, understand the value of having uh, pigments that come from green plants uh, to provide all sorts of antioxidant benefits to us. But carotenoids, when they're used to color animals in the animal kingdom, are really uh, being shaped by sexual selection. In the upper left-hand corner are pictures of two different house finches. They're both males. And you can see that the males differ in how much uh, carotenoid they are putting into their feathers. The one to the right is putting just a little in there, and the one to the left is putting even more. In these cases, that red color is provided by a carotenoid known as a keto carotenoid. In the upper middle are a series of male guppies. And in guppies, the orange and yellow components of their colorful tails are provided by carotenoids. In the upper right-hand corner, there are other fish. These are three-spined sticklebacks. And the red colors provided in these different males also are provided by keto carotenoids. We can see yellow colors occurring in the left, uh, the bottom left corner in the American goldfinch. Uh, the male is on the left, the female is on the right. You can see that the male is very bright yellow and is used from its diet to really make that yellow color come out. Whereas the female to the right has just a little bit of yellow coming through uh, and instead she's using her carotenoids to put into the eggs that she's going to lay. In the middle bottom are great tit birds from Europe. Those breast colors are also coming from yellow carotenoids. And then finally, in the lower right-hand corner are side blotched lizards. These are a really abundant and common desert lizard throughout the Western United States. The picture shows the color of throats of three different uh, reproductive types of males. You can see the leftmost male side blotch lizard has an orange throat. The middlemost side blotch lizard male has a blue throat. And the rightmost male uh, has a yellow throat. The red, or orange, and yellow throats of the two males 
are being created in part by carotenoids. But what's interesting in this use of carotenoids is that these colors represent different behavioral strategies of different males. Uh, inside blotch lizards, males can be sneakers, uh, males can be usurpers, in which uh, they are able to uh, attract a female only after it's been rejected by a dominant male. And then the third phenotype is a dominant male, shown at the right. So again, all of these are colors that are being used by animals for sexual selection. In all of these cases, the colors are provided by these pigments that we get from our diet, known as carotenoids. And in these animals, then, the carotenoids are used to advertise qualities that are either preferred by males or are possessed by dominant males. Okay, so this talk is now going to change gears for a little bit and talk about carotenoids because they're so darn interesting too. So biologists like to say that carotenoids are condition dependent. That is, they're found in plants as photosynthetic accessory pigments, but when eaten by an animal, they often generate a yellow, orange, and red color in an animal's skin. But of course, for an animal to show these colors, that pigment must be obtained from its diet. And when it then obtains that pigment, eats it, and puts it into its small intestine, and then it ultimately gets deposited to its skin, it is finally able to, respect, uh, to reflect aspects of its health, such as how available is food where it lives. Uh, if there aren't many plants in the pond that it lives, uh, it's not going to be able to color itself very much. But if it is in a pond where there are a lot of aquatic plants, it's going to color itself a great deal. And therefore, these colors might indicate something about food availability as well as foraging success. But, of course, the ability of these animals to eat these pigments and then put them to their skin relies on their ability to take it up by their small intestine. And the small intestine is actually a complicated little organ because it re relies on a process known as endocytosis to adequately absorb those pigments. And if an, if an animal is not feeling healthy, then it is probably not going to be as well equipped with the machinery to perform that endocytosis. Also, when that pigment is taken up by the small intestine, it's ultimately going to be converted to some other pigment, usually, before it gets deposited in the skin. And it's thought by biologists that that ability to convert a carotenoid from one identity to another is energetically expensive, simply because it's going to rely on being able to shift chemical bonds. So carotenoids are interesting because so many animals use them to color themselves and advertise all sorts of health information about sex. But another thing that makes carotenoids so interesting is that from an individual animal level, when an animal eats a carotenoid, its body really has to make a budgetary decision about what it's going to do with that carotenoid. So this slide shows kind of the budgetary decision-making an animal has to do when it eats a carotenoid. It's going to eat a carotenoid and it's going to make its way into the blood, at which time it's going to be called a circulating level of carotenoids. But that carotenoid that is circulating in the blood might only, it can, can be used for several different things. It can be used for coloring its ornamentation, coloring its skin, its feathers. But if it's being used to color its skin or its feathers, then it cannot be used for some other function. That is, it can't be used to, prov to provide antioxidant activity. Uh, so many animals uh, are loaded with oxidant uh, reactive processes, and I'll talk about these in a minute, but they're ultimately free electrons that cause damage in molecules of animal tissue. It's to cancers, right? Well, Humans know that we get all sorts of antioxidant, anti-cancer benefits from eating carotenoids, but it turns out that other animals also do, right? So an animal is faced with a budgetary decision of using that carotenoid for coloration or using it for antioxidant status. 
Furthermore, these pigments can also be used to make vitamins that are responsible for uh, making enzymatic reactions work better. And we know that moms even are able to take the carotenoids and shunt them to their eggs to provide nutrition and antioxidant activity to a developing embryo. So the point is, is that animals, when they're sh showing these carotenoid-based colors, they're probably indicating how abundant those carotenoids are in their environment, but they also may be illustrating that the ability to color themselves is at a trade-off with other functions like staying healthy. So carotenoids are what, you know, are really at interest with animals that use these pigments for sexual selection. So now I'm going to change gears again and talk about what the rest of the talk is going to be like. So first I'm going to give you a little turtle natural history. Then I'm going to elaborate more on sexual selection uh, and in particular on the use of carotenoids as a signal evolution in sexual selection. And then I'm going to hopefully begin to unravel the mystery of painted turtle spot and stripes. And I'm going to do that by talking a little bit about my research aimed at determining the function of stripe and spot colors in pond turtles. To do this, I'm going to rely on published research that me and undergraduate students in my lab have done, as well as also present some unpublished and future research data that we found very recently. Okay, so the talk is about painted turtles. Painted turtles are the most common pond turtle throughout the U.S. As we all know and love, males and females have prominent red, orange, and yellow stripes and spots. Because most of the time we see painted turtles when they're above water basking, we don't really know much about the social system or mating system that turtles have because they really do all of that underwater. They are above water most of the time just to achieve appropriate body temperatures so that they can go underwater and perform all sorts of other services like eating and mating and stuff. So not much is really known about the social system or mating system because most of their lives are actually spent underwater once they've achieved activity temperature. However, as you'll see at the end of this presentation, there's a behavior known as titillation where males have these really long claws and as they're trying to attract a female to mate, they swim in front of her and then while they're looking straight at her face, they take their long claws and start stroking the side of the neck of the female. And if the female likes that, then she allows the male to swim behind it and eventually uh, copulate with that individual. So uh, this talk is really about how painted turtles use carotenoids. And carotenoids in many other animals are usually sexually dichromatic. That means one sex is drab while the other is colorful. And most often males are really colorful while females are drab. We can see that that's true uh, by looking at the guppies on the left-hand side of the screen. The male guppy is at the top is, and is adorned with these brilliant yellow and orange colors, while the female below is a nice golden color, but you can see that the male above is uh, generating colors with carotenoids while the female is not. This is also true of the house finches in the right-hand side of the screen. The male, of course, is the bird with the red colors. The female is drab, and in this case, we know what she's doing is looking at that male to see if those colors are providing information that is going to help her make a mate decision. So the mystery of painted turtle spots and stripes is really that to ask the question, are carotenoids used for sexual selection in painted turtles too? What's really interesting about this question is that sex is not genetically determined in painted turtles. If you've heard before, or if you recall, a uh, painted turtle and many other, other turtles have sex that is determined by temperature-dependent sex determination. 
and the gender of an individual is determined by the temperature of the soil that the mom lays the egg in. In painted turtles, uh, it's a situation where if a mom lays an egg in cool sand, then that egg will most likely turn into a female. Whereas if a mom places an egg in warmer soil, that embryo will develop into a male. The question and the mystery really is, is can color be sexually selective if the animal's sex is not genetically determined? So this question is actually very difficult to answer if we were just to approach how color is expressed uh, by temperature dependent sex determination. So as a result, I've had to rely on a bunch of other more indirect means to determine whether or not carotenoids are used for sexual selection in painted turtles. And generally, how I am approaching this question is by analyzing aspects of the way turtles use these carotenoids to color themselves, but also trying to pair it with behavioral studies to see if, in fact, individuals that are more colorful tend to be preferred by females, etc. So here are the common tricks and trades that I use to answer these questions. Uh, of course, it always relies on me and other students going out to catch turtles, which is among the most fun parts of my job. Once I catch turtles, we bring them back to the lab into separate containers, and then we measure their color of uh, their stripes in a variety of different regions using what's called a reflectance spectrometer. This is a way of coming up with an objective quantification of how colorful these patches are uh, so that you can statistically analyze them. I also have used HPLC, a scientific method that is capable of analyzing the identity of the carotenoids that are either in the skin or the blood of the animal. Recall that one of the interesting things about animals' use of carotenoids is they often convert the pigment from one carotenoid to another by the time that they bring them to their skin or their feathers. And it's thought that this biological conversion of one carotenoid to another might be energetically expensive. And then finally, I work with a diet company, Missouri Diet, uh, to develop turtle diets that either have no carotenoids in them, moderate carotenoids, or a double dose of carotenoids, so I can see the effect of these different levels of carotenoids on their color. Okay, so we would predict that if painted turtle spots and stripes are used for sexual selection, then the pigments that generate the colors are actually carotenoid based. But we would also predict based on how it works in other animals that sexes should differ in color, even in the absence of sex linked color traits. That is, painted turtles should be sexually dichromatic. Also, spot and stripe colors should change with a turtle's access to carotenoids. In addition, carotenoid-based colors should reflect an aspect of a turtle's health. And then finally, if these carotenoids are in fact being used by turtles in a sexually selective way to maintain the color of themselves, which might, might make them more attractive to members of an opposite sex, then turtles might show a preference for carotenoid-bearing plants of, over other forms of food because providing these pigments is so important to their mate success. So I'm now going to present material from my published research to answer these questions. So the first question was, is painted turtle carotenoid based? And uh, we found that yes, it is. I collected a variety of roadkill painted turtles, uh, which was a very sad thing, but I figured I might as well make use of uh, these tissues while I can. And I performed spectrometry and HPLC on them and found that different regions of their stripes are colored by different ratios of red and yellow carotenoids, and that the colors of them sort of match the ratios of yellow to red. So for example, on this painted turtle shown here, uh, the yellow stripes on its 
underside of its chin are made up of mostly yellow carotenoids, which are also called apocarotenoids. And then if you look on the neck, you see these orange stripes on the uh, turtle's neck. And of course, they are generated by a mixture of yellow apocarotenoids and red ketocarotenoids. Of course, red and yellow makes orange. And in this case, there's a lot more yellow than there is orange. Finally, if you look at the forelimb stripes and the hind limb stripes, this picture doesn't really do it justice, but they are often a very rich red color. And not surprisingly, the forelimb and hind limb stripes are mostly generated by a high dose of red ketocarotenoids with just a low mixture of yellow carotenoids. This suggests, however, that these turtles are ingesting carotenoids from plants and they are varying what types of carotenoids approach and are delivered to different parts of their stripes. Then our lab answered the question, do males and females differ in color? Even in the absence of genetic-based machinery to color males and females differently, males and females should be different in color because the pressures of being male are so different than the pressures of being female. And we found out that yes, males and females also differ in color. In the lower right hand corner is a, a graph that shows the reflectance spectrum of males shown by the blue line and females shown by the purple line. I don't know if you can see it. I'll see if I can maybe move this bar a little. I'll see if I can move it just temporarily. At the very X axis of the bottom here, uh, you see numbers ranging from 300 to 680. This is a visual spectrum of a typical vertebrate eye, and 300 to 400 nanometers is the range where animals can see ultraviolet reflectance. Turtles possess an extra type of photoreceptor in their eyes that allow them to see UV reflectance. Humans do not see these colors. We only have three types of photoreceptors, red, green, and blue. Uh, and everything we see is a mixture of those three photoreceptors. But turtles have an extra receptor that allows them to see UV colors. And you can see here that ma males and females differ in that UV color. Well, this is interesting because, let's see if I can get this slide to advance. It's UV sexual dichromatism. Uh, the difference in color is in the UV spectrum, but along the yellow chin stripe. And really weird about this is that because it's UV sexual dichromatism, it is probably not carotenoid based, but instead something about the turtle's scale structure that allows females to reflect less UV than a male. So it's probably a structurally based uh, generation mechanism that males and females differ in. We then wanted to answer whether or not uh, spot and stripe color changes in response to carotenoid levels. And we first asked whether or not turtles differ in color in response to an increase in carotenoids. So to answer this question, I worked with Missouri Diet Company and we developed turtle diets that had a moderate amount of carotenoids, which you can see on the left bars of all of these figures. And then we compared the color change in turtles that got that diet with the color change in turtles who received a double dose, which is denoted here as C plus. So C is the moderate amount of carotenoids. C plus is a double dose. And we found loud and clear that uh, that animals that had a moderate dose uh, were less colorful than animals that had a double dose. In particular, animals that got a double dose of carotenoids increased their red chroma, the amount of sort of red saturation. They increased the amount of yellow color or yellow saturation and decreased overall brightness or whiteness, as well as decreased overall amounts of UV. We then were able to work with Missouri, uh, Missouri diets at a later point 
because they were finally successful at extracting all of the carotenoids out of their dietary gels. So they then worked with me to answer whether or not spot and stripe color changed in response to being deprived of carotenoids. Uh, hopefully you can understand that carotenoids change color not only by eating a lot of carotenoids, but they would lose color if they failed to eat carotenoids. So this question allowed us to ask, do turtles lose color if they're deprived of it? And we were also able to answer the question by comparing males and females, where the previous question just focused on males. So sure enough, turtle color changed in response to carotenoid deprivation. Uh, and sort of similar to what happened in carotenoid increases or overdoses, uh, the yellow and red chroma was affected by a drop in carotenoids, uh, such that animals had less yellow chroma and red chroma uh, when they were deprived of carotenoid, and greater UV and greater whiteness uh, when they were deprived, deprived of carotenoids. But interestingly enough, sexes did not differ in the way they responded to these carotenoid deprivation experiments. They were equally drab when they were deprived of carotenoids. So uh, I'm gonna get a little into statistics uh, to explain something else about the way things work with these colors. And it centers around an issue with me doing experiments where I measure turtles before they get a diet and then I measure the color of turtles after they get a diet. The problem with performing an experiment of that design, where I give turtles, uh, you know, I measure turtle color before they get into the lab, then I give them a carotenoid diet, and then I measure them two months later, is that in reality, these turtles are eating carotenoids all the time before they even come into the lab. And it's entirely possible that the carotenoids that these, are tr these turtles are eating before they come in the lab are influencing how many carotenoids they uptake once they get into the lab and start participating in the experiment. That is to say, uh, the pre-amount of carotenoids in their body may be dependent on, or I'm sorry, the post colors, the colors that they have after the experiment may partly be dependent on how many carotenoids were in their blood before they started the experiment. So luckily, multivariate statistics can solve this problem. It can identify whether or not pre-experimental measures of color are uh, dependent on post-experimental color, and then it can remove that effect. So that's what I did, and when I did that, I found that the colors still changed, but the identity of the carotenoids being used uh, turned out to be especially surprising. So, because of HPLC, we knew that the carotenoids circulating in the blood before the turtles came into the lab consisted of five different carotenoids. They were things like uh, astaxanthin, zeaxanthin, uh, lutein, beta cryptoxanthin, uh, and then one other. Uh, we know those were they were getting those carotenoids from their diets in these ponds, uh, and they were also present in the experimental diet that I was giving them. But the statistic identified that the post-experimental carotenoid levels were not independent of pre-experimental carotenoids. That is, if an animal came into the lab loaded with carotenoids, it was going to be especially colorful regardless of what happened in the diet. And that, again, could obscure the effects of our experimental treatment so we did this multivariate analysis, and it showed that, in fact, the identity of the carotenoids was changing once they were ingesting it. So uh, the multivariate analysis showed that after experimental adjustment, the carotenoid deprivation reduced circulating levels of beta carotene only. That is, these turtles were getting all five types of carotenoids before they entered the ex experiment in the lab and when they were in the experiment in the lab, but the carotenoid reduction changed the circulating levels in the blood of beta carotene only. Lutein stayed approximately the same, zeaxanthin stayed approximately the same, astaxanthin stayed approximately the same, etc. 
So that circulation of the orange beta carotene pigment is the only pigment affected by this deprivation. Therefore, when carotenoid deprivation changes the color of turtles, it's the beta carotene loss that is responsible for the decrease in yellow chroma and increased brightness or whiteness of their yellow stripes. So that again, that really means that yellow based color changes are actually due to orange colored beta carotene deprivation. So they are changing these pigments from beta carotene to something yellow. And HPLC allowed me to analyze this uh, and we found that yes, in fact, orange beta carotene was being oxidized. That is, there were oxygens being added to the terminal end rings of these beta carotenes, causing them to reflect a yellow color instead. So that when we deprived the turtles of orange beta carotenes, they didn't have the normal, normal substrate to make yellow pigment, and they, become, they became drabber. And recall, both males and females became similarly drabber when they were deprived of carotenoids. So to summarize this published research, painted turtle stripes and spots do change color in response to availability of carotenoids. And this is a fundamental assumption of uh, visual signals using carotenoids in sexual selection. And it indicates that loss of beta carotene is mostly responsible for this change of color. And this also elucidates that there is a biochemical conversion of beta carotene to those apocarotenoids. So now I'm going to present our final research that is not yet published, but it's being written up for publication. So the next question we decided to ask was, does carotenoid-based color reflect turtle health? To answer this question, we took uh, advantage of an unfortunate, sad opportunity. In 2019, for a short period of time, half of the population of turtles that I had experienced an outbreak in shell disease. If any of you have ever had uh, turtles in captivity before, they can sometimes get a shell disease, and it's often thought due to either bacteria or fungal infection uh, because they're not having their water changed enough or they're not basking enough or uh, another, uh, a, a, a few other variable reasons. But this happened in our lab population. So according to uh, IACUC standards, I took them out of the population briefly uh, and every day left them in what are called dry dock conditions. I took them out of water and for eight hours a day let them sit under a nice warm lamp uh, without any water. And then I gently rubbed down the areas that had this shell disease and then put iodine on it. After daily care like this, in which I removed these turtles from water uh, and then treated them with iodine, uh, after two weeks, they returned to a healthy stature and I reintroduced them into the experiment. But opportunistically, I was able to have their color uh, of these stripes before they had this shell disease and then also measured their color while they had this shell disease. And to make a long story short, the shell disease influenced the color of their stripes. For example, in the left-hand figure, uh, the animals that had shell disease just overall uh, had greater whiteness in their stripes. They were more bright, but really what that indicates is that the stripes were whiter, that they had fewer pigments in them. Also, the way that the carotenoid deprivation diet interacted with turtles that either had shell disease or did not have shell disease was in interesting and showed that turtles that had shell disease but also had carotenoids could look relatively healthy because they had carotenoids in the face of this shell disease. But if a turtle did not have uh, 
carotenoids and it had the shell disease, then it lost color. So again, shell disease was somehow influencing the way carotenoids were being used in those stripes. And then we wanted to answer another question. Uh, if these plants provide carotenoids and color, and these turtles eat these plants to maintain their color, do these turtles then prefer eating plants over things like meat? So to do this experiment, we uh, used four native aquatic plants that are common in the ponds and lakes where we capture these turtles. And we cut them up into equal sized portions and then also took a bunch of juvenile bluefish and cut them into similarly sized portions and introduced turtles to a random experiment where we fed them each of these dietary items in different orders. We kept track of those different orders so that we can control for the orders, but we found at any rate that turtles do not prefer native aquatic plants over things like native fish. We would predict that if turtles preferred native aquatic plants, that most of what turtles ate when they were fed were plants and less of what they ate if it were a fish would be, you know, fewer would eat fish, right? But we found the exact opposite. Almost no turtle out of the entire population ate an aquatic plant, while almost all of them ate bluegill cubes that we gave them. So in short, uh, turtles do not show a preference for native aquatic plants. Uh, and really, if given a choice, they eat bluegill fish, which are also uh, common and native to the lakes and ponds that they live in. So to summarize that, carotenoid-based color can also communicate information about health, which is another assumption about the use of carotenoids for sexual selection. But in contrast to what you might expect for a sexually selected use, painted turtles prefer to eat fish despite the use of carotenoids to maintain their colors. Okay, so to summarize all of this work, there are many indirect lines of evidence that seem to support carotenoids are used in a sexually selective context in painted turtles. There are also a few lines of evidence that seem to indicate otherwise, but the majority of lines of evidence really support that carotenoids are probably used in sexual selection. However, we are currently, as a lab, awaiting the results of a bunch of behavioral experiments uh, that we meant to directly test sexual selection and mate choice. So our current research is looking at turtles that have been measured for color, uh, males and females, and then putting them into tanks to get them to court and mate with each other. We think that if these pigments, these carotenoids are sexually selective, then either females are gonna prefer males that are more colorful because that's what happens in many other species, or at least more dominant males will be more colorful than those that are less dominant. And we want to look first at a, a courtship and reproduction as the context where this might happen, because again, males have these really long claws that they use in this courtship behavior called titillation. Recall that this is where a male swims in front of a female, looks her straight in the eyes, and then takes his long claws and begins stroking her colorful neck stripes. So I'm going to show you a, a video from YouTube that very briefly uh, shows this titillation behavior. So the male turtle is smaller than the female and it is above the female, the females at the bottom. The male's just getting ready to approach the female. He's looking at her face, looking at her stripes. And he's going to very quickly, in this case, stroke her neck. He's looking at her. She's looking at him. 
there. He stroked her neck there, and he's about to do it again. He's also snapping at her. Look at him jiggle his hands. Look at that. So he's striking the side of her neck. Normally that occurs for a longer period of time. But I think because these turtles probably have been in the same tank together, they know each other very well, and they could proceed to the act of reproduction without doing much titillation. So that's enough for that video, but you can see how there would be potential for each individual to assess the colors of the other during courtship. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. And to answer these questions, then, we are actively involved in filming many, many turtle courtship interactions in my greenhouse lab at Shepherd University. Uh, here is what my lab looks like at Shepherd University, uh, and here is one of my undergraduate students who assist me in my research. So, to get back to the real title of the talk, the real mystery of painted turtle spot and stripes might actually be why is it so hard to get turtles to mate? Because when we did this, we spent all last summer filming these things. They spent a lot of time assessing each other, but not a single reproductive or courtship interaction resulted in either titillation or mating. Uh, so they were definitely checking each other out and looking at colors, but it didn't lead to titillation or courtship. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate that you've taken time today and listened uh, to my research talk. Uh, thank you all from the Natural Historical Society of Maryland. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed learning about the colors of turtles, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, John. I think there's a couple of questions in the chat that you may have already answered. Right. One was about the diet impacting their health, and you talked about the, the uh, impact on the shell health. Okay. And, Let's uh, see. Uh, here's a question. Does the double dose affect their health? Right. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to test that uh, at the time. Um, the double dose diet treatment that we had was very the very first thing that I worked with Missouri Diet Company to establish. Uh, and by the, by the time we had that outbreak of shell disease that we treated, uh, the double dose diet had already been out of date. Uh, so I specifically was working on diets that lacked carotenoids instead. Uh, presumably it would though, um, because of the way we saw those who uh, were deprived of carotenoids looking different than uh, those that had carotenoids, uh, whether or not they had shell disease. So it really looked like if you had shell disease but carotenoids, you still maintained your color. Whereas if you had shell disease and were deprived of carotenoids, you lost your color. Uh, so it seems like there is really a trade-off between color and health. And that would allow you to think that if you had a double dose of carotenoids, Maybe some of that could go to health, while the rest of it goes to color. Uh, let's see if I can find some other questions. Uh, painted sliders and cooters kept indoors usually have whiter spots or stripes than their wild counterparts who have yellow spots or stripes. Uh, product of natural sunlight versus whatever was the indoor lighting. Um, it is also possibly due to that, uh, but, but certainly uh, the the whitening of the stripes in captivity also is really similar appearance uh, to what happens when we deprive these turtles of carotenoids. So it also could be that these turtles are really maybe not getting uh, the enough of the right types of carotenoids in the diet. Of course, you know, all turtle food often includes carotenoids in them, but it's possible that the brand that the uh, sort of turtle pellet is made of uh, maybe doesn't have enough carotenoid that can actually be uptaken and delivered to the stripes. But I don't know that for sure, and it's just me speculating. Uh, are these turtles ever released to their habitats? So all of these turtles are always released to their habitats 
Uh, I study them for two months at a time and then rele release them to the same ponds that I always capture them. So believe it or not, I've been studying like six to seven different ponds and lakes around here, the same turtles in them as a really long-term ongoing sort of capture, mark, recapture uh, experiment as well. Um, uh, also, you uh, there was a Barrett Freelander asked a question about box turtles. Um, the orange colors of box turtles, I think, is also carotenoid based. We don't actually know yet, um, but so many of animals' colors that are orange are carotenoid based. We know in painted turtles now that all of the yellow, oranges, and reds are carotenoid based. It sort of isn't too far of a stretch to imagine that the box turtle colors are also carotenoid based. Um, I would love to actually ask these questions using box turtles, but they're not anywhere near abundant as painted turtles. So for now, I'm sort of going to keep working on painted turtles to ask these questions. Uh, yeah, perhaps there's sexual selection on both males and females. Uh, yeah, um, so it, is it possible to conduct mate selection studies? And as you see now, that's exactly what we're sort of starting to do in the lab this last summer and what we'll do next summer as well. Uh, giving turtles the option to eat high versus low carotenoids. That's an excellent point. Uh, that would be something I'm going to write that down, in fact, uh, to consider as a future experiment. It's great that there's a, a contribution we can make to your. Oh yeah, research. absolutely. It's so neat to meet people who are interested in these animals and these topics. And let's see, a question from uh, MJ Dadris. Is there any correlation with carotenoids and metabolic issues causing shell curvature? Um, I'm not sure of anybody doing research on this question currently. I have read a bunch of older literature on uh, the shell curvature issues, uh, the developmental anomalies that occur in many turtle shells. It's not just painted turtles, but it occurs in all turtle shells. Uh, and these were studies that were done in the 70s and 80s, uh, but at the time they weren't asking carotenoid questions or anything. Um, but at the time, it was really just thought to be uh, genetic anomalies, uh, mutations that cause uh, some of these scutes to develop incorrectly. Uh, how uh, long does it take for a diet change to affect stripe and spot colors? Uh, I did these experiments over a two-month period. So to be safe, it would be two months. It may occur even sooner than that, but it wasn't a time frame that I wanted to take a risk on. I figured it's going to be plenty of time to show an effective color, and it did. But it could happen even earlier than that. It's just that I didn't do the measurements to determine how early it was. Uh, male paintings are horrible to female turtles. No kidding. Uh, as you saw, that male kept snapping at the female, even when they're uh, interested in trying to court each other. Um, there could also be individual personal preferences. Selecting a mate that comes from a wild population, that's right. Uh, we know in lizards anyway, um, lizards that are placed in you know the same vicinity for a day or two, in the same tank or what have you, get to know each other well enough to treat each other differently compared to an animal that has just come out of the wild. So, you know, it's it's easy to imagine that even turtles uh, get, a, you know, adapt to a captive situation pretty well so that, uh, you know, when it meets a turtle from the wild, all of a sudden it's going to treat it like a stranger and be aggressive as a way to establish dominance with it. Um, so yeah, the length of a relationship probably indicates how uh, they might act to another individual turtle. I guess that's it in terms of the written questions that I can see. Uh, oh, one new message even. 
Oh, it says, thank you for your presentation. You're very welcome. I, I love talking about this stuff. Really glad you were interested in watching and listening. Well, let me thank you again. And uh, thanks to everyone who uh, attended. And hopefully we'll see you at the next Herp Club meeting next month and check out some of the other programs we have to offer. Thanks so much, Joanne. And thanks everybody for sticking through the technical errors as we were trying to resolve some of those issues. Great. Thanks again. Bye. Have a good night, everybody.